The information found in today's podcast episode is not intended to be a substitute for treatment from a licensed mental health professional. For listening to the Honey Bee Podcast, Episode 5. Today, we're discussing the concept of death and dying, the grief that is associated with death, and ways to help support your child during their experience of grief. Here to help us with the conversation is Dr. Robin Donaldson. Dr. Robin Donaldson is a licensed clinical psychologist, certified yoga instructor, and co-founder of Solace Club, LLC, a care package company for those in grief. After the tragic death of her husband in 2013, Dr. Donaldson experienced firsthand how people in our society struggle to help those in grief. Many don't know what to say, what to do, or are afraid of doing the wrong thing. She wanted to do something to help change that. And that was how Solace Club LLC was born. Through Solace Club's blog posts and social media, Dr. Donaldson helps educate others about the do's and don'ts of grief support and offers tips for the grieving on how to navigate loss. She also started a yoga for grief class at a local studio in Las Vegas, Nevada, and has recently earned her certification as a yoga instructor to be able to instruct these classes in the future. Dr. Donaldson currently leads a table in Las Vegas for the dinner party, a community of those in their 20s and 30s who have experienced significant loss. They gather together on a regular basis to share their experiences and support one another. In 2018, Dr. Donaldson will also be hosting an online show focused on support for life, changes, and loss. And without further ado, here is Dr. Donaldson. Hello, Dr. Robin Donaldson. Thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. How are you doing? Great. Thank you so much for uh, having me on and chatting with you a bit about grief. Absolutely. It is my absolute pleasure to be chatting with you because I have a question and I need your support with this. Okay. Are you ready to hear this question? Yes, ma'am. All right. Here we go. Dear Honeybee, my teenage child has experienced the death of a loved one. We did not expect that this person would pass away and we've been stricken with grief ever since. How do I talk about death with my child? Mm. That is a question I feel like every parent, regardless of whether or not they've been in that situation, uh, that question has crossed their mind from one time or another, um, given all the death in our community in the past year or so with simply family death. So yeah, that's quite a profound one. Yes. My initial thought, uh, if you don't mind me just diving in there. Absolutely. Please do. Is that, of course, I have tons of questions. For example, how old the teen is? Because a 13-year-old processing death is very different than a 17-year-old processing a death Mm -hmm. because of developmentally how their brains are and their emotional awareness and intelligence at the time. And I think it's also important to consider who died. It sounds like everybody was stricken with grief and it may simply be, you know, everybody is grieving. This was a significant person. Now what? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that regardless of the age of the teenager, you're balancing the child within the teenager and the more adult entity within the teenager. And so, you know, in certain ways, 
in helping the child process, you know, just thinking about helping them cope, uh, you definitely want to give them space to play, to rest, to have all those things, uh, self care that they normally do, you know, let them spend time with friends, uh, let them engage in their sports and activities if they are up for it. And on the other side of things, uh, some of the responses that they will have to grief will be very similar to adults in that, you know, the cognitive functioning may be challenging. So they may have a hard time concentrating at school. They may space out, forget to do chores, and it may seem as though they are acting out when actually They're simply trying to do their best uh, while they are grieving. Now, the parent asked specifically, how do I talk to my child about death? And my thought is, hopefully, by the time that the child is a teenager, you have spoken to your child at least once about this thing called death, because death is very much a part of life. And even though we always joke that teenagers may feel and think that they're invincible right um (laughs) they're at least aware that we grow old and we die and that sometimes we don't grow old when accidents catastrophes happen absolutely so i think that that what i'm hearing a lot more um because everybody is aware that this person is dead is how do you talk actually about grief and what i would offer to that parent is instead of all the talking try doing a lot of listening. So how is the teenager feeling about what has happened? What are they feeling if they know what and how they are feeling and supporting whatever emotion that that might be? Now, Robin, you have said many things that really piqued my interest. And there are a few, you know, from that statement, I have questions for you. So you said Hopefully, depending upon the age of the teenager, hopefully there has been some conversation in the household about dying and about death. And it brought up a memory for me that perhaps maybe will come up in this conversation. If it does, it's great. And if it doesn't, it's great, too. Can you give me, give the listeners some more information about the importance of talking about death? and grief that comes out of someone that you know or don't know dying. What is a developmentally appropriate age to have that sort of conversation? Well, I think that once children are able to start having conversations and are able to understand that there is life and that there is death, I'm wanting to give a a specific age here, but all I can think of is, you know, anywhere from as young as two, depending Mm -hmm. on the circumstances, and up to to four for that initial piece. My thought is children often have pets. They often have goldfish, for example, and pets can die. Yes, And so if this happens, that's the opportunity. I'm not necessarily sure if everybody should, if parents should jump on it as, all right, we've potty trained, now let's talk about death. (laughs) I'm not suggesting that. (laughs) It's not a requirement. However, I think that you can have age-appropriate discussions about death, even as young as that. That is excellent. You know, this makes me think of a moment in time where, I lost a loved one, an extended family member, a loved one nonetheless, and I was younger than teenage years. I was approximately 11 years old, tween. I was a tween. Mm -hmm. And all I had known was that my extended relative had passed away and that there would be funeral services for this person at the end of the week. And I had to wear a dress and some, you know, small hills or some variation thereof. So I go with my parents, I walk into the church and I'm hearing the preacher speaking about life and death. And then I get up with other people wanting to pay their respects. And that was the first time that I'd ever seen a dead body. And I quite didn't know what to expect from the funeral service, aside from what I see on TV. So you mentioning the importance of having a conversation with a child, even younger than teenage years, it really resonates with me. And um, yes, pets do die and people die, and it is a part of the life cycle. 
Another thing that I, I wanted to bring up, because you're absolutely right, at 11, your experience sounds very similar to many children's experience, first experience with death. And yet, I would push back a little bit on that and would suggest that you had more exposure to death even before that, mm. as most children do. You know, right now, we are in the holiday season, and we just got done with Halloween. Halloween is a holiday that directly involves death. And my thought is if they're old enough to understand Halloween and be scared by the skeletons, then they're old enough to talk about death. Look at that. Yeah, because I think that we, in a way, by not talking about all the different sides of death, even within Halloween, that's all that people know. And so, right, when a child goes up to, to see their deceased relative, you know, they're thinking about scary masks from Halloween. Yes. That's not going to make this any better for their processing of grief. That is a profound statement in itself. Yes, something like Halloween could create the conversation about death and dying. Yeah. So for the parent who may be reluctant, confused, uncertain, how to approach the conversation about death with their teenage child, you know, I don't know if this is early teen or later teen. And of course, developmentally, it does make a difference. For the parent that's hesitant and maybe resistant or afraid that some way, somehow speaking about dying and death and the bereavement process that happens after that, some parents may think, I'm really going to traumatize my child. So maybe it's better if I don't say anything and kind of let them find out like I did. Uh, What sort of advice or wisdom or information would you like to share with that parent? I would encourage that parent and similar parents to give their children more credit. Mm -hmm. I think that sometimes we try to protect them in ways that, and especially as it pertains to grief and death, that ends up hurting them. Even if parents decide not to say very much, children are watching them Mm -hmm. and know, hey, something really upsetting has happened. Mom, dad, you know, grandma, their caretaker is really upset and perhaps, you know, fallen apart and they need the reassurance. They need to know that this is normal and that it's hard being able to share that the caretaker, that the parent is very sad, you know, being able to model an expression, a healthy expression of emotions and a healthy discussion of their emotions is a really good way to show the teenager how to talk about these things. Absolutely. Okay. So yes, give your child more credit that they will be able to tolerate the conversation about death and the grief that comes from it. And also this conversation would allow them to better organize why grandma or grandpa so sad or why is my cousin so distraught or why does dad seem checked out and any other variation of reaction that can come out of losing someone that you love and care about. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I think you summarized it quite well. What sort of strategies would you encourage for the parent to practice in terms of self-care and self-soothing? Because you raised a wonderful point about having this sort of conversation as a model and template as to how to handle this event that is certainly going to happen because we are alive. What sort of strategies do you have to offer the parent or caretaker of this child so that way they have the emotional buffer to create this conversation? And before you answer that, something I think is important to mention is you and your colleague, and I will let you explain more about that because you'll do so very well, have created this amazing service, this amazing product, this amazing resource called Solace Club. Can you tell us a little bit about the Solace Club? Sure. Um, So Solace Club was created in October of 2016. After my own experience with uh, losing my husband, uh, he died in a motorcycle accident approximately four years ago. 
and one of my co-founders and partners death of her father and we recognize that oh gosh there's so much support that people in grief desperately need but that others around them have a hard time providing Mm -hmm. and so as a way to be a part of making a change we created solace club for people to send something other than flowers for Mm -hmm. people who want the individual who is grieving to remember to take care of themselves to make and sit with a nice hot cup of tea and relax Mm -hmm. Uh, they are given permission to grieve however they need to grieve so we currently have six boxes which includes the holiday box up on our website but we also provide subscriptions three six and one year because After the funeral, after everybody goes home, Mm -hmm. the person or the people grieving are still having a very difficult time and are struggling just to get through the days. But now that sense of community isn't there. Their support is not there. And so being able to send a box can be a very nice reminder that people are thinking of them and that they are sending them this love and support. Uh, And the other thing that we do as a part of the service is email um, and contact the people that send the boxes to say, hey, you know, this is the deceased person's birthday. It's coming up. You may want to reach out to the person that you bought a box for and see how they're doing because this may be a really tough time for them. Wow. So, yeah. That is extremely thoughtful, loving, nurturing, and, you know, in a very simple way, very cool. That is so cool. I love that. Yes. As do we. Yes. It's definitely a passion project, and I'm really just very, very thankful to be able to have this opportunity to do it and constantly learning, you know, how to better support those in grief. You said something that kind of went along with my statement of, you know, grandma or grandpa so sad, dad seems checked out, my cousin seems agitated or whatever description I used. And you said that the service or the products that the Solace Club provides to people is a way and a means to give a person permission to grieve how they need to grieve. I don't know if there's anything more that can be said about that because that statement was beautiful in of itself. And I've just, if there is anything more that you can say about the permission to grieve how one needs to grieve, I would love to hear what other wisdom you have to say about that. I would definitely say that need is really individual. Hmm. So I don't think that there is a standard, this is what you have to do. We've moved past the stages of grief because Kubler-Ross created that after observing people that had terminal illness, Hmm. not people that were in different types of grieving situations. However, we've taken those stages and we've medicalized it. We've made it a requirement of people if they are going to get through grief in a healthy manner, and that's not how grief works. Uh. And so because of that, really what I would encourage folks to do or how to do this grief thing is listen to yourself, giving yourself permission, and trying to do it in a healthy way. For example, I would not be super supportive of somebody you know, drinking a couple of bottles of alcohol every night to cope with. Well, why not? Well, because <laughs> the repercussions, and it may not be the most effective way of grieving um, or of managing their grief, we'll put it that way. So within those boundaries, right? Like if they leave their entire family and their job, like there are many things that could have dire consequences that they may want to reconsider. Yeah, um, in our society, as it pertains to grief, everybody has an opinion of how the other person should agree. And sometimes it's based off of that person's experience of grief. Well, when I grieved, you know, the death of my mother, this is what helped me, so you should do that. Hmm. There's this idea that, well, you know, it's been four months. Why are you still so sad? 
there's, you know, like this, this urgency for the person grieving to get over it. Yeah. Get over it. Get back to your daily program. Right. Right. And it's because we want everybody to be happy that somehow happiness equals healthy. And I don't agree that that is the case with grief. I think that, you know, you want to say need, I think we need to be sad at times. You're not going to be sad all the time, but there is something that needs to be experienced with grief. And so that's why I really emphasize I'm giving people permission to grieve however they need to grieve. Beautiful. That is absolutely gorgeous. So Robin, as we wind down in our conversation you have given a wealth of wisdom and guidance during what is for many a difficult conversation to have. And also, I'm curious to know, I've, of course, have gone on the Solace Club website. I'm curious to know if the items that are in each package, if those are age friendly, I believe that it is. But can you speak to the developmental appropriateness of the items that the Solace Club provides? Sure. We have yet to come up with a kid's box, which sounds somewhat along the lines of what you're asking. And at the same time, when I have been now talking with people about the boxes, most people think that the anger box is a kid's box, which, in thinking about it, outside of the warheads, the little candies that we put in that could be a choking hazard, so you may not want to get those in. They're really Parents really, take those out. Yes, you may want to take those out, but... Now, there's a meditative coloring book that kids love that can be extremely helpful and a good self-regulatory piece in there. And a Dana dolls. Huh, what is that? So a Dana doll, this is, you know, we order them, we did not make these. It is like a, a stuffed doll that when people are very upset, they can hit something with. Yes. And it doesn't hurt anything. So very similar to like blowing off steam, just getting some of that frustration out. It's a vehicle for that. I love okay. that. You know, and at the risk of, you know, having someone wag their finger at me, I know from my personal experience of grief that sometimes the pain would be so deep and so gut-wrenching for me that the urge to want to strike out was present. And having something called a damn it doll would have been so helpful for me at the time that I needed it and could be helpful for me in the future. So the cool thing is, even though you all don't have a specific box for a child, if the parent had a box for themselves, there could be items that a child could use. And it sounds like if an adult could have a grief box, for lack of better words, or a product from the Solids Club, that it could be appropriate for teenagers too. Oh, absolutely. We have a stress ball, which is another way of getting some of that stress and, and frustration out. Journals, which you know, teenagers can use, children can use. So there are quite a few items in there that kids like taking baths. We've got the bath salts, oh, wow. and that's part of their relaxation piece. So, so yes, I mean, definitely there are things in there that pretty much the entire family could use. Yes. Oh, that's amazing. Well, Robin, if you have any additional wisdom to impart upon myself and the listeners, we would love to hear it. My biggest one is there's no timeline on grief. So it goes into that permission. You get to grieve as long as you need. And chances are it's not going to be a matter of getting over the grief. Uh, Grief requires integration. Hmm. It's a matter of taking that experience, that loss, and that love for the person that passed away and integrating it into who you are as a person. You know, they they talk about always carrying the person in their heart. You carry that love and you also carry that loss in your heart because that's part of your relationship with them now and that that's okay. And so in a way, that grief, because that integration of loss will never end but it will now be much easier to handle just a part of you and a part of your life of holding that and learning that you can hold that Mm -hmm. is so empowering. 
Dr. Robin Donaldson, you are amazing, and I truly appreciate you for joining me in this conversation. Where can people find you? Do you have a website that folks could locate more information about the Solace Club and what you're up to? Absolutely. www.solaceclub.com. The store is on there, but also the blogs that I post are on there. Uh, We are present on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, uh, you name it. We're out there, so definitely search for us. Very cool. Robin, I hope that you have a phenomenal rest of the day and a spectacular rest of the week. Thank you so much. Take good care. Thank you, Maniac. I appreciate it. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. That was a tremendously helpful conversation with Dr. Donaldson. To learn more about Dr. Donaldson's co-creation, Solace Club, please go to the website, which is www.solaceclub.com. Again, that is www.solace. C-L-U-B.com. To learn more about the table that is led by Dr. Donaldson with The Dinner Party, please go to the website www.thedinnerparty.org. And if you're interested, and I know you all are, check out Dr. Donaldson's web-based show on life changes and the loss that we typically experience during the lifespan, please go to www.wcobm.tv.com. Thank you again for listening to today's episode. Until next time, peace.